Hi everyone, I'm Graham Richardson Locke. Welcome to our second series of Festival Coffee Breaks. Uh, it's great to be back for the fourth in our new series. Uh, and I'm uh, FESPA's Head of Associations and Technical Lead. As a member of the senior management team, I'm responsible for supporting our international member associations and continuing to develop technically useful material to support FESPA's speciality print communities. I'd also like to let you know that I've been working in screen and large format digital printing for more than 35 years now, so I've been around a while. I initially trained as a screen printer and my career in print has given me experiences in management and direct ships in point of sale, textiles and military electronics before I became part of the FESPA team. I've seen the benefit of networking through uh, FESPA and know that my knowledge and awareness have been enhanced by taking part in a host of events and seminars. And as an international speciality print trade federation, FESPA continues to focus its efforts on knowledge sharing and community building within the screen and wide format digital print landscape. Since FESPA's foundation nearly six decades ago, its goal has been to help print businesses using screen and digital printing to advance and take advantage of the latest technology. We aim to keep today's session to around an hour as we understand that your time is limited. And we hope, of course, that you'll benefit from your participation and you'll find some useful pointers and tips to build on that will support you in what can only be described as a disruptive and challenging marketplace. I'm now going to share with you the topic um, and question slide. So as we consider today's session, uh, I'm pleased that we're going to benefit from the experience of Matthew Parker, champion of print, who joins us again to provide more guidance at the sales end of the operation. Uh, our topic today is a, a new way to connect with your customers using personal branding. In this FESPA coffee break, we'll focus our discussion on how to get started with personal branding to support your business. We're all familiar with LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and maybe in my case, less so with TikTok. Um, it feels uh, to me at least that each requires a specific type of post, LinkedIn being the most obvious for sharing business related material, and Instagram, of course, being the most visual. As to Facebook, I'm sure many of us uh, are there to share family photos, our favorite jokes, pet videos and musical suggestions, but how, um, how do we present ourselves as personalities in business that will support our aims to build new relationships and enhance our connections? This of course extends beyond social media uh, and I trust that Matthew will help us to get on board and give us some solid tips on what works and what may reflect poorly on us. I suppose for me, it's about sharing the things I feel passionately about, which may include all aspects of creative print, typography, um, and trail riding on my mountain bike. I know that I'm also comfortable to share support for the causes I believe in, but anyway, let's, um, Let's move on and get, uh, Matthew, if you can give us a, your introduction, that'd be absolutely lovely. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Graham. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. It's great to see you all here from so many different places. Uh, welcome to all the international people. Um, it's great to see you here. Um, I'm Matthew Parker. I'm the champion of print at Profitable Print Relationships, and I used to be the buyer. I'm now the poacher turn gamekeeper. Um, my last full time job was buying all the print, heading up all the print buying for Future Publishing, one of the UK's leading publishing companies. And when I left, I thought I was going to set up my own consultancy, helping people to buy prints on a more strategic level. And I still do projects like that uh, today. But what actually happened was the phone started ringing and lots of my suppliers uh, were on the phone talking to me going, Matthew, you are hard work. Can you come in and tell us how to deal with people like you? And that's how Profitable Print Relationships was born. I'm basically spending my time uh, talking to companies like you, telling you what it's like to be on the other side of the fence from your sales team, your marketing team, uh, your uh, emails, your websites, 
what it's like as a buyer, how I'm going to react to that, and some of the things that you might be able to do to improve your engagement with your prospects and your customers to ensure that you're winning new customers and more profitable customers. So that's really the focus of, of what I do. Um, and over the years that I've been doing this, I've really focused on trying to look at what I was doing at Future, which was taking best in practice from other sectors and bringing it here to print as well. And um, personal branding is just one of those things that I think is, is very important. Brilliant, thank you, Matthew. That's a great, uh, great intro. Uh, I'm just gonna share now the, uh, the slide for Matthew and I with our contact details, which we'll, we'll share again at the end um, of today's session. But you can see here our email addresses um, are there. So if you want to reach out to either of us following on from this, then um, please uh, feel free, take a note, but it will be repeated at the end. Please do, and do reach out for me on LinkedIn as well. So uh, yeah, while well, we're talking personal branding, search for Matthew Parker and print, you'll find me. Uh, please connect, uh, it'd be great to, to link up with you on there as well. Perfect, cool. Uh, okay, so I'm now going to launch um, a, a poll just to see who's in the room today and just get an idea of what kind of printers that we have um, in attendance. So if you would please uh, just fill in what type of printer you are um, over the next minute, that would be perfect. Just gives us a bit of a better indication. I can feel the tension building with this one, Graham. It's I know, it's amazing. This is, uh, this is one of the longest minutes of my life. I, I don't <laughs> think a minute can actually last as long, but it's it's always interesting. I'm I'm lucky because I'm seeing the uh, I'm seeing the numbers change. Um, the boats flooding in in front of me. Yeah. So we have um, okay. So we have people engaged in screen printing, uh, wide format digitals, uh, a few more industrial printers than usual, um, small cohort of garment decorators. Uh, actually, probably the largest cohort today would be between textile printers and wide format printers. Brilliant. Well, look, thank you so much for, for filling that in. It just allows Matthew and I to know um, who's, on, who's on the other side of the, the camera, so to speak. Okay, so uh, without further delay, I think we should kick off and get into it. So uh, Matthew, the first thing I want to, to kind of ask on behalf of our attendees is, is how do you define a, a personal brand? Well, I, I think you did it very well in your introduction because rather than just saying that I'm Graham Richardson Locke and here's my professional career, we actually got to know a little bit about you. We got to know a little bit about your values, what you stand for, what you like doing. And suddenly we're getting a sense of Richard the person, not just Richard, the member of, uh, of FESPA, of the organisation. So I think what we need to realise these days is we've got a, a rise of online and suddenly that changes the dynamic of so many personal relationships. So for many years, we've seen the brands and they've been desperate to, to try and build trust online. And they've got all sorts of ways of doing this. Uh, but what they really want is to make sure that, that they are getting their personal fan base together, that they're giving people reasons to like them and therefore to have a dialogue and engage with them. And some of them do it more successfully than others and some are more believable than others. Um, but I think that's probably the case on a personal level as well, because we have to do the same now. More and more, I think we're seeing people getting to know people online. In fact, although we've taught loads, Richard, I don't think we've ever, we haven't ever met in person yet. Um, so no, we haven't. No. no. So that's just one example of the fact of the rise of the online relationship that's happening. And whereas before you might get to meet someone at an event and hopefully those days will come back sooner rather than later, or you'll be able to visit someone at their offices and you get a sense of getting to know that person. 
these days we haven't got that opportunity to do that uh, offline so often our main opportunity to do this is online so we have to think very much about how we come across online not just in a professional but in a personal capacity as well so i've got a couple of examples that i picked up um, over the past 12 months that spoke to me quite a lot and the first was I um, had someone who contacted me wanting to work with me um, and unbeknownst to me she'd been stalking me online for a little bit and seeing me in action in various forums and things uh, but um, she said that one of the things that really swung it for her was the fact that uh, at Christmas I'd said that I was um, hoping to spend a few days with my family and we were going to have um, yeah, some walks by the coast as part of what we're doing and she loves coastal walking as well um, just that little bit clicks yeah. and means that I've probably got some of those same values it's someone that she feels she really can relate to when we're talking about mentoring and working one-to-one -one in a way that if I just put up what my services were and you know what my um, my skills were and what my background was um, we wouldn't be able to engage in that same way so for that reason that works very well in a positive way of building a personal brand. Um, in a slightly less positive way, I was on a webinar recently and it was run by a LinkedIn, a so-called LinkedIn guru. Um, and they were going to uh, tell us all about how to manage our content on LinkedIn and um, they spent more of their time selling. But one of the questions that came in probably about a third of the way through as he was showing his slide deck. I thought it was very interesting. Um, mm. And this, there, there were a lot of Americans there. And um, this, this comment came up in the chat, hey man, you know, just seeing that all your slides are of middle-aged white men, you know, does that say anything about you? Just, just asking. Yeah, and because that person had maybe unwittingly transmitted their brand values across mm. in their slide deck and in what they were doing, that was just one more way and they were getting quite a lot of pushback from the audience in what they were doing anyway but this was just one more way that they were alienating themselves from many of their audience so i think the important thing to remember is that a personal brand doesn't have to be a mission statement and when we talk about companies yeah, we've got all these marvellous mission statements and brand values that all employees and all members are supposed to adhere to. We don't have to be that explicit in what we're saying on our personal brands. What we do have to think about is what we want to talk about and what we want to portray online and offline and realise that particularly in today's environment, that has to be just more than our obvious business values. So I hope that kind of gives a kind of background as to yeah, it does. We, we might think about a personal brand. And actually that's why I didn't include my whiskey collection in my intro because it didn't feel like an appropriate space <laughs> to add that in. Whereas uh, trail riding on a mountain bike is, uh, is more um, appropriate, I believe. So. Um, well, we might it. You know, if we were having the, the FESPA <laughs> evening drink session, then it might be very appropriate to put your whiskey collection. Exactly. But I have to say, Graham, that at 11.13 in the morning, that's it's a little inappropriate. bit thinking about whiskey, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so why do you think it's particularly important now? Why, why kind of in this um, post-pandemic situation does it, does it feel so important? Um, I think the way we're doing business is changing for a lot of people. So not only do we have the rise of online to, to work with, and I don't think that's going away. You know, there's lots and lots of people now. Uh, you know, I've been working with Zoom for ages, way before the pandemic, but there's lots more people now who want to interact by Zoom. You know, I'm doing much more Zoom training and webinars rather than face-to-face. -face. And I don't think that's going to go away. Uh, you know, and there's some very good things with that. There's a lot less travel involved. I get more family time because I'm not spending my time in um, soulless hotel rooms, uh, you know, waiting to deliver training to people. Um, so it's no bad thing, but we have to think about how we communicate in a more engaging way online. But I also think that the pandemic has changed the way that many of us do business. Yeah, you know, it's not everyone, but I'm seeing a lot more people coming through who are asking more on a personal basis. Yeah, you know, I'm making connections on LinkedIn and people aren't just going, 
hey Matthew I'm so and so can we do business they're going yeah how are things over in the UK at the moment if they're in America because they don't really know you know how is the pandemic how's you and your family doing you know I hope you're okay in a much more personal way that I was seeing I wasn't seeing in such to much to such the same extent before the pandemic and again I think and I hope that that's a trend that's here to stay and what I'm sensing is that actually this is usually very genuine it's not just making conversation or trying to um, it's, em it's real empathy isn't it it's, yeah uh, so there's yeah. a lot of empathy around in addition i think we're seeing a changing face of a number of buyers and this started off i think with younger buyers a lot of people are much more worried about the values of the companies they deal with and that's extending out to the people that they deal with as well so um, before the pandemic, um, I was helping one of my clients at a, at a show and everyone was very much concerned with the environment there and asking a lot of questions about that. And the way I was quite surprised about because you know, until recently, most buyers had said, well, you know, never mind the environment, let's reduce costs. But now we're seeing a new switch in that. And I don't think this is just the environment. We're seeing the rise of corporate social responsibility. We're seeing the rise of companies wanting to be seen to be doing business with the right people and the right companies and to have the right relationships in their supply chain and some of them are doing it because their consumers are demanding it some of them are doing it because they feel they have to comply with corporate social responsibility rules and guidelines and some of them and an increasing number are doing it because they actually believe in this yeah and they want to define themselves authentically yeah. and yeah, that's the type of people and the type of company that they want to do business with, either because it fits in with their brand values or with their personal values. So I'm seeing a lot greater desire to have that alignment in the supply chain with your own personal values as a buyer or a company and with the customer values of the audience that your uh, customers may be serving. So we have to have that good fit with our customers. Um, and I said initially this started off amongst the younger buyers, but I'm seeing that coming up through the age ranks, even to a lot of people who are as old and cynical as I am. Uh, you're getting uh, people now who have changed the way they think about how they do business. I mean, I have hugely, you know, and I'm much more concerned about the environmental impact of what I do and how it has on the planet. You know, I've, I've said publicly, you know, you're not going to find me flying out to America to speak at a conference um, for a couple of days anymore. I'm not doing that sort of long haul travel for short periods. Um, so I've changed my stance on that. And I want to work with people who think the same way. And well, well, maybe if you have an invitation to go and speak in California and then do a week's coastal walking. Maybe. That's slightly different. <laughs> if I'm going to go out there for a long period, then yeah. that's fine. Um, yeah. But, you know, if I was before I was just like nipping over for a night, two nights, coming back again. Um, it's not great for the environment. It's not good um, on a personal level, both in terms of family life and in you know how the um, after effects hit you. So um, you know I don't have a desire to do that anymore. But I'm increasingly considering who I'm doing business with and why I'm doing business with them, and that's actually extending out to my clients as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that. I've got a couple of stories to share later on. Yeah. But, you know, I do think about whom I'm working with, why I'm working with them, and are they a good fit for me? You know, and if there's someone who's really against the values I stand for, do I want to be working with them? Um, and I think more companies are beginning to think in this way. So, well, yeah, being able to be open about your values, I think, is very important. I, I agree. And I think that the. Um how much more pleasurable it is to align yourself with things that you have a personal connection or interest to and if you can do that with people that uh share a similar outlook then um it it, it makes things more satisfying i believe uh, let's move on to um so the the how to of this discussion so if i want to make um my personal brand well where where do I need to begin and what should I be considering? Okay, so the good news about this is you don't have to work on it too hard. Okay. Um, 
you know, it, I think if you spend hours trying to define your personal brand and write it down and, you know, create your own personal brand guide, I'm you're probably going to get to the point where actually it's not that authentic after all, because it's been too manufactured. So, uh, yeah, it is something you want to think about. And I think the first thing you want to think about is what are your values and your interests? You know, and that shouldn't be difficult to come up with those answers. You know, but, but what are they? Um, and ideally, you're then going to maybe sit down and write out just a few words for work and a few words for your personal home life values. Yeah. Then they get to stick there. And because you've written them down, they're going to be in the forefront of your mind. And that means that you're much more likely to share those values and think about how you share those values going forward. So you're much more likely to drop it into your social media or your conversations, you know, just little things. So for instance, you know, I've thought quite hard about the fact that I do believe in inclusivity and diversity. Um, and I was probably guilty of having, um, you know, a lot of um, white middle-aged people in my blog pictures, whereas now, because I've thought of that actually as a value I want to espouse. I'm a lot more careful in how I pick pictures for my website and I try and make sure that I cover everyone, um, you know, and, and look for people, you know, to make sure that people see that, you know, I'm open and I want to appeal to a broad range of people um, and that should be quite normal. So just little things like that are coming front of mind because I've got that list of values that I have that work for me and for my organization. If you manufacture it too much, I mean, we can all come out with these buzzwords. Yeah, you look on LinkedIn profiles, yeah, and the number of people who are innovative and passionate and driven, and you, know, you don't believe a word of it because they're just trotting out all the buzzwords that we used to see on CVs, and they're just trotting out all those buzzwords, and it doesn't come across as true. So you wanna make sure that, first of all, you're putting it across in a believable way, um, but secondly, that you are actually saying things that you do believe in and you're not just paying lip service to them because it's, it's very easy. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And we all see the companies that say they stand for particular values and then they get caught out on it straight away. And we will personally as well. You know, if we're not prepared to practice what we say we are, then we probably shouldn't be saying that we are like that. Now, I'm, as you know, um, you're a whiskey fan. We shouldn't be talking about so much about alcohol at 11 o'clock in the morning, but I like my craft beer. Um, and I went to a beer festival um, a few years ago and there was one big brewery there and they had a, um, a big banner up uh, with their brewery logo. And then underneath it said, um, passion, innovation. And I can't remember what the other one was, but it was, it was another like a sustainability. And, and they could have been anything. They didn't come across as a brewery. They just came across as someone who got a marketing team in to find some nice buzzwords. Um, they could have just been the, as well been talking about a marketing firm or an engineering firm. You know, it could have been anything. So we need to think about how it fits in with what we do as well and that it actually says something about us and about the sector we're in. You know, your love of typography is great yeah. because you know, I like good typography too, but it's relevant to the sector that we're in as well. Yeah, you know, the trail riding is important, but having a little bit for the sector as well is important. The other thing that I think we need to think about is we don't have to include everything. So there's certain parts of my life that, you know, are, are for me and my family um, and um, they don't have to be shared online. So I see a lot of people who share an awful lot of their personal life online. Um, and if you want to do it, that's absolutely fine. But don't feel that you have to. Yeah, and I probably see some people who maybe share just a bit too much of their personal life. Um, you know, some people who might come across as quite smug about it, perhaps. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's very open to misinterpretation, isn't it? If yeah. you're if you're kind of um, if you appear to be too cocky, or you've just got a nice new shiny car, and you you don't want to really be coming across as bragging, or yeah, there are there are quite oh, I, I find it quite odd sometimes the sort of sharing of I've just had a slice of pizza well you know I'm, I'm glad you're not hungry anymore but um, yeah. I, I don't think it really qualifies as having value as a post so I agree with you I think it needs to uh, unless you're giving a shout out to you know a local pizza company and you want to yeah. give them a bit of love back then that's absolutely fine but just saying I have pizza for lunch is a bit dull yeah and I 
don't share anything about the lives of my wife or my daughter because they're not there for you know social media or for my brand building or my business building you know for me that's not appropriate other people have a different view and that's absolutely fine but for me personally um you know i don't think they really want to be plastered all over linkedin in connection with print um and i wouldn't inflict that i wouldn't inflict that on them so um you know there's whatever things are personal to you that you don't wish to share just because i'm encouraging you to be authentic and have that personal brand you are allowed to think that are off limits yeah there's a the 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 filtering is the important thing isn't it is as you say don't be don't don't be vague and, and present a persona that you can't live to because you know as they say that old expression of the truth will out um yes okay absolutely let, what i quite like to do is uh, is move on to the sort of how how and where we can publicize our brand so i mentioned in my sort of introduction my thoughts on you know insta linkedin and and facebook um and my complete lack of awareness of tiktok other than it's a place for short dances for people that can seem to dance very well um well i think you should try it out graham i'd love to see you dancing <laughs> Maybe uh, maybe after the next Vespa Awards dinner, perhaps I yeah. could be um, I could be tempted. <laughs> um, but yeah, on publicity. So where where and where and what do you think are the the kind of again good places to start the the journey with it? Okay, and you focus very much on social media, which is a great place to show your personal brand. Actually, we should share it everywhere. So it's social media, websites, blogs. Um, it's on your, um, when you're live as well, you know, everything I do, I hope a little bit of me comes across, you know, you've learned a little bit about me today and I put some of my values and my, my brands into, um, into everything that I say, into every presentation that I do so that people get a sense of me, the person, as well as, you know, the, what the information that I'm trying to get them to take on, on board. Um, so, it, you know, at meetings, whenever it is, I'll put it over. So let's start off with social media. I mean, clearly you might want to put some of these things across in your social media profiles. Um, and I personally, I'm not a great fan of these ones that say, um, you know, whiskey loving, trail riding, typography loving, um, technology fiends for FESPA or something. Um, just do it doing yours um you know it, it's nice that it says a bit but you don't have to be that blatant about it so you know when i'm on linkedin um you know my my headline is all about the services i provide but you get a bit more of a sense of me as you dive into into my profile and what you really really get to know me is when i start posting so for instance every friday i post my takeaways and i'm a big lover of photography so i quite often share uh, one of my latest photographs or one of my latest um, images that I've created from photography um, just to show a little bit about me and just because it's a nice thing to share. Um, yeah, I will share my thoughts about things that I believe in passionately in some of my personal social media posts. So I'm happy to mix up a personal social media post and some work social media content as well. It doesn't all have to be uh, blogs and information and calls to action to buy um, I think it's quite nice in that mix there's a little bit about what I've learned this week and from a personal point of view or if something that's affected me personally that I'd like to uh, talk about um, with my um, work network um, then I will share those as well so that comes across yeah and just you know, I might go, this idea happened to me when I was climbing a mountain this week or whatever it is that um, I was I was doing. I might put in a bit of my personal life in there. Um, and I hope that comes from the website, you know, about me. You can see a picture of me in the mountains there on my about me page on the website. And you can find out a little bit more about some of my other personal interests there as well. I'm not going to say them all because then you can all go to my 
website at profitableprintrelationship.com. Find out some more about me as well. Um, but equally in my blogs, you know, I do occasionally mention my wife and my daughter in my blogs, um, you know, if I want to make a point, not with any particular personal information, um, but you know, I did once about um, some of the myths we have in the um, in the print industry. You know, some of the beliefs we have that I don't think are true. But I started off with the tooth fairy because my daughter was younger then and believed in the tooth fairy. Um, so yeah, I'll bring those things in. Um, you know, I'll talk about my mountain side of things uh, in some of the things I wrote a book about sales planning. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of my love of mountains that comes out um, through there as well because a lot of the analogies I created were from big mountain expeditions that I like to um, armchair read about. So we can bring this out in a lot of different ways. Um, I've also seen people who are doing charity or giving exposure on their websites to good causes that they believe in as well. And I think that's, that's a really nice thing to do. Um, and then, you know, when I meet people, um, it's nice to get to know them. You know, I won't suddenly go come up to people and go, hi, I'm Matthew and I love mountains and prints and chocolate. But yeah, as we talk through, you'll get to know a little bit more about me because I will put that in there. I won't just have a distant professional persona on there. Yeah, it's about revealing some of your character and connecting with people, isn't it? It's quite a natural. If, you, if you're relatively um, extrovert, then it's quite a natural thing to do. But it's just... I think it's the understanding the parameters that we set and knowing how far to go and how long to go on about it for really is, yes. is kind of important in, from my point of view. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a couple of interesting points you brought there. You know, it's remember your own personal limits. Um, yeah, don't spend all the time talking about you because actually people like to talk about themselves. So it's nice to find out about the other person. Um, and then you'll you'll find out more about that way. Um, you don't have to be an extrovert to do this, oddly enough. I think a lot of introverts are quite happy to say a bit about themselves online anyway. Um, and that's actually quite a comfortable place for them to do that. So I know um, a number of introverts who have great passions and they might not say everything about themselves, but they're really interested in sharing their passions um, and they'll do that online. So a couple of people I know in the photography sector um, you know, and I feel I know an awful lot about them and their values, um, despite the fact they are introverts, um, because they can't help but talk about what they really love, um, both in their personal lives. And well, I think I think often with, um, I, you know, likewise, I have uh, people very close to me who who would describe themselves as introverts, and I think I, I maybe for for a while thought of introversion as being. Uh, you know a reluctance to engage but I think it's just that often people that have introverted introverted character need time away to recharge whereas people who are extrovert want to put them to uh, actually recharge within the social context and yes it, it's quite an interesting way of understanding the differences in 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 character really because um, yeah. No, I, mean, I wonder, in, in, in the conversation, I've just learned another thing about you today, which is about photography. And, you know, I, I also, for my sins, I, I've had the opportunity to work with some very, very talented photographers in my fine art business. And um, that's kind of led me to develop my interests. And, in, you know, my um, family are constantly getting cross with me for going out and buying a new higher megapixel camera and, uh, and of course <laughs> I need an essential group of lenses to be able to um to capture the things I want and um and and it I, I think it's it's interesting just to see breadth in people and you know this this kind of um corporate persona actually just doesn't reveal enough to raise the interest level and the kind of opportunity for connection in my view, um, which I think is part of what should encourage people, isn't it? Is to... there are, I, you know, so I went, um, I did go to the last um, US event I went to. Um, I was just chatting to people. I, I met someone who had as deep a love of chocolate um, as I did, actually spent the evening, much to the surprise of many people, kind of getting quite deep into, into chocolate. Um, but it's great, you know, I have a, a, as well as yeah, a very useful 
industry uh, connection. I now have someone who I get on well, you know, I keep up with regularly. He likes mountains as well, but he's been over here. I took him over to uh, my mate Nick at Seven Hills Chocolates. He's a marvellous chocolatier and chocolate maker, and he saw the production facility and, you know, we've shared tastings and it's, it's great. Um, you know, I really enjoy doing that. However, I do, there is one other thing I just want to, to add to this yes, as well, uh, because um, we've talked before about being true and not fake um, and, and the truth will out. So do be aware, particularly if there's things that you don't necessarily want your personal network, uh, sorry, your work network to know about, or your professional network to know about, um, do be aware of what's on your personal social media as well. Um, because a lot of people these days will research people quite thoroughly, and I do that online. Yeah. So um, I, I connected with someone on LinkedIn, and um, yeah, there was potential there. So I thought I'll just research this person a bit more, and I came across their personal Twitter feed, which is absolutely horrifying. I mean, you know, very far right wing, very racist. Um, got up to some really dubious. Uh, things in her time out of work um, and I thought this is not someone I want to work with um, yeah and I have to say as she was a sales person as well yeah, if any of her prospects or clients had found any of this I think they could well have refused to work with her um, either from a personal point of view or the fact they wouldn't want to be seen with someone who is putting those sorts of views out on social media where they could be found. Um, she didn't have a long career in sales. Um, yeah, the last time I looked at her Twitter feed, which was a while ago, she was heading off to be a pole dancer in Ibiza. So um, maybe a more fit you know, career. Yes. So, uh, but yeah, these things do get found out. So, um, you know, Remember, if you are dancing on the tables and doing it on TikTok for after the next Festival Awards event, um, you know, that may come back and haunt you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, trust me, there are um, there are several photos of me at the end of FESPA rap events that, um, that have come back to haunt me. Not bad ones, I hasten to add, but um, just me pulling silly faces and such like. Um, OK, so I think the final kind of element for me that, that that would be very interesting to discover is the understanding the difference between you know my personal brand and my company brand um what what have you where where would you guide us on that that front so i think one of the interesting things is we spend a lot of time on a company brand <clears throat> and not very much time on our personal brands typically mm. but if you look at linkedin i would say that over 95 percent of my engagement comes from my personal linkedin profile rather than my company page even though i'm i'm very active on both um, and the statistics that i have on that are not at all unusual so most people if they have a too active company page and a personal page they will find that their personal page is where they get the engagement and where they get the uh, the relationships and potentially the, the future business from as well. And yet we spend all this time on the company brands and not on our own. People are still buying from people a lot of the time. And it may be online, but actually they want a believable person that they can get on with and understand uh, and is it fair to say you want to buy from a credible person Absolutely. and in that in that research phase when you're looking at looking at people and you're seeing their personal brand it's their their credibility their you know it can be their it can be as you described their kind of personal attitudes and characteristics and and of course their professional experience and we all we're all looking to minimize our risk aren't we and uh, that comes from having a better sense of who we're going to connect with because none of us want stuff to go wrong and many people i think are going to want to work with someone that they get on with and connect with and they'll go back to that person and go look you know maybe xyz company has got a better deal or is doing something differently that we like what can you do to get nearer that they're much less likely to do that with um the person who feels a bit less about themselves no matter how good the company brands behind it so i think that's one thing the next is that company brands can often be tarnished so 
many of the big brands out there come with horror stories, come with things that people are only too happy to spread the bad news. So I think it's quite important to bear in mind that your personal brand is very separate from the company brand because it's you, yeah. but also that your personal brand can sometimes save the deal if people are maybe a little cautious about a company brand, maybe a little cynical about a company brand. Um, people try and put the two together, but you can't clone a company persona. You know, if I suddenly came and worked for FESPA, then you can give me the FESPA t-shirt and umbrella set. You can even give me the FESPA tattoo, but you can't stop me from being me. Even if there was a you know, FESPA corporate, and there's some, a number of companies out there, I'm not suggesting for a moment that FESPA is one of them. There's mm -hmm. a number of companies out there who really have messages that they want people to promote, that they have topics that people are not allowed to talk about because they're trying to put together a safe company brand. And it comes across as inauthentic. You're never going to be able to stop the person coming across as their true selves. So think about how you do come across and what you're doing uh, when you have that company brand. So I, I think there is a big difference between them. And certainly you, you, what you want to do is, is encourage the, the right re revealing of, of passion and drive and interest in people, don't you? Rather than stifle it by containing them within a too tighter corporate kind of culture that doesn't allow them to actually fully participate, I think. It's just that, it's just the judgment piece of what you, what what is, what kind of reinforces uh, the business messages you know what's what's good for the what's good for the organisation you work with versus what what may be um, uh, damaging or, or or create issues. And I think that um, some of the highest achievers are those who are aligned with their company values and brands, but they're allowed to be themselves as well and uh, be a little bit inventive and creative around that at the same time. Um, and yeah, you know, as opposed to people who believe everything that the company uh, says and, and tries to replicate that in what they're saying as well. So, yeah, I, I think we have to realise that the two are very, are very different. Um, and your personal brand will stay with you for life. Your company brand may change as your career develops and you go on to work with other organisations. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I've really enjoyed. Um, I really enjoyed talking with you, Matthew, this morning on this. I think um, there too, are there, there are a few questions in the in the Q and A. So, should we um, just go and have a look and see what's yeah, um, let's see what's coming up. See what's there. I always enjoy this because I have no idea beforehand what the um, what what we're going to get. Um, okay, so some some things in the in the comments as well in the chat as well as questions. So what the happens first normally, normally? What happens in the? Well, I can look. I can look at the chat after. Normally, what happens in the chat is Kelly encourages our people in the chat to move over to Q and A. But yeah, we'll we'll. I have. We'll, don't we'll, worry. <laughs> we'll we'll look at both. So. Um, uh, so David uh, Zamath, who's, uh, who's one of our regulars. Hi, David. It's good, um, good that you've joined us again. Always appreciate, Hi, David. All, always appreciate it. Um, he, he's uh, thanking you, Matthew, for your, your uh, discussion today. So he's saying um, confidence uh, is a key word um, in business uh, and, and that has increased with the pandemic. Apart, apart the uh, the online dialogue, don't you believe that as an approach, I must get confident. Um, mm. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna read this as it is, and I'm gonna hopefully you can just help me just to. I've got the question up here already. Ah, okay. So I think what what David's saying is apart from online. Isn't a personal approach? I think he means offline as well. Yes. Is a must to get confidence, and he's thinking particularly in the equipment business. Um, so, people buy from people. I totally get that. However, there is a logical side to things as well. So, no matter how great your relationship building, 
it's not going to work for you unless you have the right offer and the right opportunity for your prospects and clients. So what we should remember is that 60% of the buyer journey can typically not be influenced by the salesperson. So that means that the buyer may have written out their specification without involving a salesperson. Uh, they may be having internal discussions about how things progress, which can't be influenced by the salesperson. Uh, and they may be talking to their network about how a company or a salesperson is uh, before they engage with them. So all these things have to be right as well. Having said that, if you can get confidence from someone in your, uh, in your product, in your service, then that is one of the keys to winning the business. And being able to say that personally and believably will absolutely help with that. Uh, it will also, I think, having the right personal values will help with that as well. So I don't think we can say that the one-to-one -one relationship is the be all and end all, but it's an essential component of being able to uh, win a sale. So I hope that's answered your question, David. I hope that's I've interpreted it in the way that you meant. Um, please feel free to put in more comments afterwards or to uh, I can see David's raising his hand. Um, so please feel free to, to um, put something in on top of that if I've uh, gone down the wrong, the wrong road with that. OK, while I'm um, because I think while Kelly is. I don't know if David's going to add another question to the feed, but I will we'll, we'll come back to that if he does. Um, so um, we have uh, C C Silver um, uh, is asking what kind of writing style is suitable for a strong personal brand that will generate new customers. How detailed should it be? Uh, what about narrative? Um, should it continue over several posts or weeks? Uh, and what about the the repetition across different channels? So uh, the remark is that personally don't want to read the same post on on Insta as on Facebook. Um, okay, lots to lots to unpack there. Yeah, there so is. I, yeah. The, the key bit about writing styles is two things. First of all, be yourself and come across as you. So, um, but the other thing is there are specific techniques for writing online and specific techniques for making sure that you appeal to uh, different learning styles for people. Um, and I teach with all those. I think we're probably outside the scope of today's discussion on that one, uh, particularly because it would take me a fair while to go through them. Um, but um, uh, the, the, the key element that I always say to people when they're creating content is being your customer's shoes. So what does your customer want to read about, not what do you want to tell them? So, yeah, I see so many um, blogs or posts where people are going, it's marvellous, we've got this wonderful new press, whereas most of your customers don't care what press you've got. Um, yeah, what they care is what can you do to help them build their business? And if you can give case studies of how you've helped other businesses uh, do that, then that's a great way to, um, uh, to educate the customer and get them involved with you. If you can share industry statistics that are relevant to them or other information that's relevant to them, but equally, if you can say a little bit about yourselves as well so that people see that you have that personal brand um, and that can be in a separate post or it can come into the main blog that you're writing. Um, Storytelling and should it continue over several post weeks, you've always got to be consistent with your blogging and your social media presence. So if you sign up to my email newsletter list, you'll hear from me twice a week. Yeah, I uh, post something nearly every day on LinkedIn. Uh, I post three or four times a day on Twitter um, and I post um, three times a day on my LinkedIn company page as well, or possibly two times. I can't remember which now. Um, I do repeat on different channels. But typically, I'm driving people back for long form contact to my content to my own blog. So it may be that I've got a different style of post, which is driving the, the person there. Um, I think it's OK to repeat because social media tends to be a fairly uh, transitory place where people pop in and pop out again. And you want to make sure that you are 
uh, capturing as much of your audience as possible. Having said that, I rarely do an exactly the same post. Um, because you know, diff after. different, like the difference between Insta and LinkedIn, if you're Insta, you really need to be thinking about the visual. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and you need to be thinking about um, platform specific approach, don't you? Like, and I suppose the difference between if you were to post the same um, post on Twitter and then transcribe that directly onto Facebook, it would just look completely weird. Uh, no, it looks absolutely it fine I'm it. So I'm, I'm okay with that. But yeah. I think you just have to learn where your audience hang out and focus on that on that platform. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. You know, if you're doing Insta and TikTok, that's going to be harder to translate onto LinkedIn, for instance. Um, so you do have to be a bit a bit careful on it. Um, so I hope that that helps. Um, uh, you've just missed my content, uh, my social media content webinar. Um, see, so um, but um, yeah, I, I cover that a lot on there on different types and. Um, yeah, I do think the writing side is quite important, but if you cool. can beat yourself, that's a great place to start. So hopefully, and there's, um, yeah, you've got the opportunity to connect with Matthew after this to, to get, get further into that. Um, there's, uh, um, same guest ha has a, another um, question, which I have to rephrase for, uh, for the sake of public decency. Um, <laughs> but yeah, with, I think it, you know, she, the question is being asked about um, how do you actually respond with uh, cancel culture um, and um, I suppose being aware of contentious um, posts. Uh, how do you interpret, how, you can see that same Q&A. Yeah, I think the things i mean yeah if, if someone has annoyed me and they've cancelled me at the last minute that's a one-to-one -one issue that i have to deal with them as a customer separately and i would never take that onto social media um so yeah if i had someone i was annoyed with that doesn't come out on social media that's not the right um venue for it um, I'm, I'm very happy to have a robust conversation with a customer who's messing me around and I'm very happy to issue them with the right invoices for the time that they've messed me around on. Um, you know, and yes, I might lose that customer, but if they're going to keep treating me like that, then that's fine as far as I'm concerned. In terms of uh, a normal post, I like to be a little bit contentious in my posts. Um, so, um, you know, I wrote one where I was uh, saying that, um, you know, we don't need as much colour management as so many, as many printers think we do. And I had some interesting um, uh, studies and statistics to share with that um, and that certainly caused a storm on, on LinkedIn um, but I keep my storms to um, the relevant areas so yeah I've got areas which are off limits uh, you know some people have clearly some very um, uh, strong personal views um, and particularly maybe some of our US friends are very happy about talking about their beliefs in a way that you know, me as a, um, you know, just a, a, you know, a restrained English person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I always try and keep religion and politics off my social media um, feeds because that's when it starts getting a little difficult. Um, and if someone is trying to pick an argument, um, I'll either ignore them or I'll take it offline rather than trying to, to carry on for the sake of it on a social media discussion because it's it, it's not. Well, it's not for... good for your brand either, is it? You get you getting into a uh, position of conflict with someone publicly is not. Uh, it's it's just not. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy to disagree with people and put forward yeah. my views on. Um, you know, areas of sales or um, the print industry I'm very happy to do that that's I don't have an issue with that at all but it has to be in a professional and courteous manner and if the other person isn't prepared to do that that's when the conversation stops a measured response perhaps yeah um so we've got a couple of a uh, couple of other questions here one from Paul um hi Paul, hi, Paul. nice to hear and, from you um and Marcel as well about and this is there's a kind of pertinent to the size of business. So I think from from Paul's question is, you know, how much time should a should a small company spend on their social media content, and 
and who should do this function. And then uh, Marcel is uh, asking really whether does the size of your business matter in the way you present yourself? I mean, I, I suppose from my point of view, I think um, I've noticed it within my uh, business outside of Vespa that I have, um, uh, I use like Hootsuite as a way of managing posting more efficiently. Um, I think that there are tools, aren't there, Matthew, that can help you be keep yes. it efficient. And if you're a if you're a small business, that seems to me to be quite a, an important thing to do because I think it can become it, it. Like when I heard you then talking about the number of times that you post a day, I'm like uh, full of um, full of respect for you because I just I, I think I've really struggled to. to do. A lot of that is automated. Yeah, you know, it doesn't mean I don't engage and go on and engage with people. But it's, yeah, it's a plan. I kind of I set it all up, yeah, a few days in advance. Um, the only place I post manually is LinkedIn. Um, you know, and if anyone wants to find out more about that, come and ask me afterwards. So, um, uh, so I, we have two slightly different questions here. So, Marcel, uh, do you think the size of your business matters to the way you present yourself? Um, I don't think it does actually, because if we look at Apple and when we had Steve Jobs and, and now um, Tim Cook, you know, they're both very strong personalities who head up that business um, and you see their sense of personality and values coming through very strongly on that business, just as much as you'd see mine as a uh, almost one person business, um, you would see mine coming through as well. So I think that the individual can come through on that. Clearly, you know, if you're in a large um, corporation and you're a mid-level person, uh, your own values shouldn't conflict with the company values. Um, but I think you carry on and present yourself as you, and I think you'll come across more authentically. And I think companies will um, embrace that more. Having said that, you know, if you're a large company, you might want to think about some, some, cor uh, some corporate social media guidelines um, and just what messaging isn't, isn't allowed on there, just so that we stop people from getting a little bit too outside of there. Um, Paul, how much time should um, small companies spend on social media content? A lot. Um, who should do this function? Um, I do all mine myself. Um, yeah, it doesn't take up. Yeah, I, I also fulfill nearly all the business I do. So I manage to mix and match the two. Um, that's fine. Um, I, actually you've put content as opposed to social media so a lot of time on social media content you can always outsource i'll always throw my hat into the ring to write content for people as a content writer um, you can outsource some long form content or you can write it yourself but a lot of the everyday posts where you're sharing things i mean come on it doesn't take that long to create a nice video on your iphone um you know where you're giving your thoughts or to share some pictures of the projects that you're doing so um uh you know it's it's something that everyone can do themselves and doesn't have to take up a huge amount of time but if you do want to outsource please let me know <laughs> we've got another couple of questions coming on well, in chat as well yeah i'll just i'm, I'm going to take i'm going to take one more um matthew because of our time sure um so we've got one here uh, which i think is a you know is a, a an interesting one and i think probably um, there are probably quite wide views on, but what are the best times of day and days of the week to post in the UK? Are there times of the day and week that are better for reach? Um, so, yeah, my definitive answer to this is you can never work out when the best time is. Um, so uh, it will depend on your audience, it would depend when they're around, it depends on your platform. You know, someone shared with me uh, when I was running my content webinar um, a very good infographic that they'd had which showed me exactly which days would be good days and poor days for posting in the upcoming year. How on earth can they predict that? Um, so you know, people go here are your best times yeah, for whatever you do, never call someone on a Friday evening. Yeah, that's one of my best times when I've been calling people. So sometimes by breaking the rules, you will get better results. So um, sorry, Beck, I know that's probably not the answer you want to hear. Um, I would just mix the times up and rather than making sure you're doing it at yeah, 7 a.m. every Thursday, try different things and see what happens. Perfect. And I'm glad you find that liberating. You know, don't, don't, there, there are no social media rules like this. And yeah. people who say there are, 
um, are probably trying to get you to purchase some not very good advice from them. I suppose the thing is, is it's um, one of the things that builds audiences frequency, isn't it? Is quality of content and frequency. Make, make, your, make, your, make your posts interesting and useful to the audience and then um, keep doing it. Is that, that I, would, I would say that helps. Beck, if you want any more guidance, do connect with me on LinkedIn, and then you'll see the sort of content that I'm sharing. Um, and if you've got any questions on that, you can always ping me a message. Brilliant. Well, look, uh, we have, as always, run over slightly, but not too severely. So I think, Matthew, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to say um, that, you know, as I do at the end of these sessions, sadly, that's all we have time for today. Um, but uh, thank you to all our attendees for joining us. It's been, um, we're very pleased to have you. And Matthew, it's been lovely to uh, speak with you again. And we've had a very stimulating discussion. So I really appreciate your time and consideration. Um, we will, of course, be back uh, in a couple of weeks. We're going to, we've got one more in this series because, um, August, we feel most of our European colleagues are going to be on, on leave. So we're gonna, we're gonna have a gap in August, but in two weeks time, we'll be looking at uh, the next topic, which is, which is gonna be a good one. It's, um, it's carbon footprinting print products. And we're gonna be sitting with Dominic Harris from Carbon Quota and Nathan Swinson Buller from ImageCo as the printer in the room. Uh, there'll be a registration link sent out in due course and of course if you're interested in watching this webinar again or telling a friend so that they can watch it, it will be on YouTube on Vespa TV, uh, should be from tomorrow. Uh, we will send out a survey after, the, uh, after this concludes. We would really value you taking just a couple of minutes to give us your opinions or any comments or just just fill out the survey and return it because we thrive from having feedback and we are listening to what our audience wants. So if you want to suggest a topic or if you want to say get a new presenter, then um, please feel free to speak as you as you find. Um, I'm going to share now again with the, uh, the uh, slide with our contact details for Matthew and myself. Um, and I think yeah, next one sounds great. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on a holiday, but I'm definitely going to tune into the, the replay on that one afterwards because um, that sounds really interesting. Well, it, uh, I think it's particularly interesting because it'll be broad-based carbon footprint, so it's beyond paper and board into plastics, uh, dye bond, and you know other materials. So uh, I think my, uh, my conversation so far with Dominic have been very, um, very interesting. So I think there'll be quite a stimulating discussion. Um, so I'd just like to say from my side, thank you very much for your time. And we look forward to having you back. And Matthew, you can have the last word. Uh, well, thank you, Graham. <laughs> I'm honored. Um, I think my last word is probably going to be um, goodbye. Um, but thank you all for coming here. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, please share your personal brands with me. Um, Selena, I'm sorry we didn't get to your question. Reach out to me on LinkedIn or on email and I'll try and help you. Um, I've really enjoyed it again. Um, yeah, I hope we get a chance to do another one of these uh, before too long, Graham, because uh, just great fun to do. Well, we'll be back Three, in the three. <laughs> yeah, we'll be back then. <laughs> cool. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.